In a world of complex and overwhelming challenges, the Inspirational Insights Podcast provides a shift in perspective. Dive into the minds of brilliant thinkers, creatives, and edge-riding leaders who have adapted their thinking and leadership practices to match today's perplexing challenges. Your host, Donna Jones, leads captivating conversations with trailblazers from diverse fields who have transcended tough and complex conditions to contribute to a healthier world. Can we collectively break old habits to reinvent the human work earth relationship and support the vitality and diversity of all life? Harnessing agility, embracing possibilities. Welcome to the journey. If you've ever felt uncomfortable with being alone with yourself, as some people did during COVID and the lockdown phase, or if you're struggling with your emotional health, my guest today brings insights and practices that can restore control over how you move through the world, the decisions you make. Inspired by his experience working in corporate, combined with his personal sensitivity, in this episode, we're talking about digging deeper to gain clarity and connection to who you are at source. This is a practical, from a business point of view, essential bit of mastery that you cannot pass by and hope to be fluent with the future and the unfolding of events. Stefan Secatori started WeFlow to support the retrieval of inner freedom. Stefan is the director of WeFlow Lab in Amsterdam where he develops practices and spaces where individuals and teams can grow with a background in business intelligence, like 18 years, and MBTI coaching. Stefan studies the hidden links between organizations, human potential, and states of consciousness. Stefan is a sportsman, team player at the core. He trained and facilitated within integral communities in the U.S., Paris, and he is now in Amsterdam. Stefan, welcome to the program. How has your journey unfolded? How has your consciousness evolved through all the experiences you've had? A couple of small questions to start the, uh, <laughs> the conversation. Thank you, Dana. It's a pleasure to be here. I met Stefan through an introductory experience that WeFlow runs, and it was just a very calm start to a conversation that was just absolutely lovely. One of those moments where, if you recall it, Avatar the statement, I see you, it was that kind of moment where somebody sees you. And and that was for me really nice because sometimes it's really not easy to be seen in this world. So let's explore how you got to where you are today first. So I'm a French citizen. I was uh, born in South of France and I got very interested very early actually in how organizations are functioning. What are the different layers? What are the processes? How to make an organization succeeds both at the financial level, but also at the human level. I had the chance to practice a lot of team sports and had the experience when I arrived in the business world to work with teams very quickly. It's very interesting how the human factor can be both a vector of well-being for professionals, but also a vector of success. I didn't realize uh, how important some of those aspects were until I reached a a more senior uh, position in in my career where I was managing teams of up to 12 people in large, very large organization as a ERP software. So I was a business intelligence consultant and I was managing large programs. I went to a series of discoveries in my personal journey, uh, self-studying psychology, evolutionary psychology, integral psychology, And at some point, realizing that there were some aspects in different worlds, the worlds of sports team, high performance business, and the world of personal development, group practices, and some of the piece of the big puzzle that we were missing on some sides were actually available on the other side and asked myself how to combine the best of all these worlds. It stayed an inquiry in me, but up to, I would say, 10 years ago, it became very concrete. How I would describe your work is basically you bring emotional maturity to companies, but it starts the individual. The value of that is as leaders lead, if you're not secure in yourself, you're going to be a toxic boss. The relationship between the work you do and the experience people have in what's now termed toxic workplaces or toxic Mm -hmm. bosses is incredibly relevant. 
but the onus is on the individual to step into it and to decide they want to be better as a leader, better as a decision maker, better as a person and embark on the journey. What's the uptake in business for this conversation? Because you're doing an incredible job of adapting to different worlds. What's the gift there? What I'm going to say today is based on our empirical experiments at the WIFLO lab. So it started as a physical lab in Amsterdam, where we brought a lot of uh, individuals, experts, managers, CEOs. And also it became later on a virtual lab during COVID. There's been about 150 people who contributed at the original uh, two first phases of emergence of WIFLO. And in total today, we've touched directly or uh, indirectly through public events, uh, about uh, up to almost 2,000 people today. The sum of our experiences, we call that collective wisdom. What it told us is that there is some key aspects in the work environment that are invisible, transparent, but very present and very impactful. You talk about toxic management, toxic behaviors in business. What it influences is the emotional state, mental states, state of consciousness of the employees. When we want to look at these topics, there's some parameters that sometimes stay transparent. What we quickly figured out is that the way we relate with each other, that is either uh, default or implicit or deliberate, is very impactful and has way more impact on the state of presence and state of consciousness that the employee have than what we think. So culture influences states and the state influences the performance and the performance influences the results of the business. We started realizing the link between all those components of elements and the integration points between each. For example, what is the right moment to emerge or define a culture and how does the culture influence the relationships, how does it influence communication and the individuals and how do individuals influence the state of their colleagues um, and directly, indirectly, and then how does all this influence the proper execution of processes, for example. Uh, we found a lot of integration points and then we started developing new deliberate ways of uh, relating, being, growing, even playing with each other that cover all of the needs that a human-centered professionals or managers or entrepreneur may have today. We wanted to create a toolbox that is turnkey, easy to use, easy to share, so that we collectively do not have to reinvent the wheel. What kinds of scenarios do you find yourself working with in this work? When people come to you, first of all, do the people come to you or does the organization come to you? When when it's the people, what do they bring into the room? So in terms of scenarios, we work both with individuals and basically professionals who want to improve their skills or acquire new skills that are future-proof and also with organizations. Today, the collective work of the team, I would say is uh, 60% uh, with organizations in business and 40% with individuals. Um, As soon as we started, there has been a lot of uh, word of mouth effect. We have a website, but we didn't have the need to largely promote. Uh, We had uh, new clients coming from the network and also the conferences in which we display and demonstrate our, our work experientially has brought more, let's say, clients and practitioners in our collective. Now, the way my personal work is spread is that I have, on a weekly basis, projects with organizations that are small or medium, sometimes larger scale organizational uh, transformation or development. And it's usually, for example, a startup that is working on an AI well-being, but for... (laughs) which the internal way of working is not always generative of well-being. How does a well-being company live up and walk the talk of the vision they're trying to bring to the world? Usually it takes a lot of technical skills to develop those new apps, new products, and you don't always have the time or the energy or the, let's say, knowledge to learn 
all the kind of ways of doing business that are conscious, that are human-centered, that are required to generate well-being as we are working. We went very far in that domain. So we work with startups, we work with scale-ups, with all the WeFlow startups. We are a small team at the moment. We have four organizations that work in parallel. Another example is in the social care field, a group of directors that had bad past experiences in toxic environments or toxic boards, actually wanting to create their own company with their ideal culture, their ideal way of working, their ideal way of growing, and looking for tools that allow them to do that, not finding exactly something that's applicable right now through world of mouth finding us and then doing a large scale project of starting an entire organization where emotions are clearly let's say they have a place in the the company where the culture is instantly um, we we bring people in a clear culture that's horrible to the well-being and there's a human support system so basically creating the ideal human centered company from scratch we have other types of projects, but I can say more bit uh, later. Yeah, I really appreciate the transparency of your work. There's some myths, I suspect, that need to be busted. Because for a long time, I would watch videos on HBR, and it would say something like, it's rational decision-making, no emotion. And I thought from an evolutionary perspective, that that's about as flawed as it can get. What other myths do we need to bust in order to accept that this is a whole picture whole human beings, when we talk about being human centered, you take your whole self into the room. Some people would argue that, but if you're going to bring your full potential to the work, and if the work is going to bring out what you don't know you're capable of in a most positive beneficial way, then we need to break down a few myths. What do you feel are the top level ones that need to go in order for us to really evolve and advance our consciousness and beneficial impact in the world? One of the myths is emotions are swampy and a potential slippery slope. As a manager, I want to make room for them while staying professional. But if I make too much room, I risk delaying the execution of the business or literally risking performance or profits. That's a big myth. It's not completely true. As a society, it is very important to separate personal self and work self and to make a clear distinction about these two contexts. However, also in business, what is very real is that emotions are the juice of the excitement, the juice of the work. They are motivating factors. And in many fields of work, especially the ones that are closely connected to humans, our emotions and our state is raw material for our work. It's hard to work with patients who are in emotional difficulty if my own emotional state is not uh, healthy and stable and strong, that's one myth. So the way we solve this myth is that we made things clear and transparent. We started being truthful about these topics. And uh, everybody has a view uh, and a dream or a vision. We call that the inner culture uh, about how they would want to relate ideally at work. Let's say the, the, pl- the right place of emotions uh, at work. We brought uh, people from different sectors, different personality types, different expertise, and we looked at what's their actual experience as they are doing the work, how does their subjectivity and connects with their work and with their emotion, and what's the place of emotion. For example, one of the realizations that we had is that anger is actually extremely valuable as an asset, (laughs) and maybe it will surprise some people, valuable as an asset for an organization. We found out that when there's anger, that's unspoken, that stays. It Usually the negativity increases and the disconnect increase, tensions increase. And then often we have a founder team that's getting like dissolved or, 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 or some relationships are being destroyed that we need to repair. But so what we figured out is that if we make room and we give the right support to somebody who feels angry in connection, what is behind it is actually some inner resources. There's the inner resource of clarity about what is my boundary, what is my need. There's also the inner resource of creative power. And if we're angry about something or disappointed about something, ultimately, subjectively, it implies that 
we know what's not okay. Therefore, there must be somewhere inside us the wisdom of what should be there instead. So we managed to find a way to support uh, people, managers, and employees to transmute those emotions and then also find the source of the structure and the process and the containers that they want to create or can create. Then we guide them to the steps after that to actually implement those kind of clear new structure, new process using their creative power. So anger becomes a resource. None of the managers we train, none of the companies we work with or other trainees we have is afraid of anger or managing the angers of an employee anymore. And some of us are even able to see, oh, nice, you feel anger? Amazing. Let's make room for that. <laughs> Sounds a bit uh, counterintuitive, but emotions are not something bad that can be a resource for the company. Thank you. It reminds me that conflict is really a creative force and we tend to treat it as something that's destructive. So therefore we resolve it. We put it on the side and by avoiding it, you increase the risks. It's one of those things that, that anger that some of these emotions when, re, when directed toward achieving the goal are phenomenally powerful in my observation, particularly as a facilitator, that's what I observe. Let me just ask, in rational decision-making, the uh, idea is that rational decision-making is rational. We just think we, we don't feel. And yet the research I've seen says that the rational decision is both. You have to think and feel, otherwise it's not going to be a sustainable decision or one that touches people in a positive way. What, what's your feel about that? Rational de decision-making is very important. It's part of steering an activity to be financially sustainable and, and, and economically generative. The, the fruit of our experience shows that if we include rationality in a container and in a space that also has room for uh, intuition and um, emotions as data, as inform subjective or intersubjective information, then we extend the range of our perception. If uh, I'm about to make only rational decision, but it's part of a flow between, I don't know, board members or directors, let's say directors, and two of them have a hunch and intuition that something different is possible. But in the process of the decision making, if at no moment there's a room for them sharing their state, their mood, their intuition, their intention for the call, or something they would want to bring in addition to what's being shared as uh, data and rational thinking, if there's no part of the process that makes room for that, then we lose intersubjective information. And what we figured out is that if we bring this information, it doesn't forcibly have to be processed. If we both have an intuition and one person share, we're about to make this decision, but I have an intuition that something different is possible. And there's something you said that really, it resonated with me, but I don't know exactly what to do about it. And then the other person or director will say, actually, I have exactly the same feeling. And then hearing them say that another person, their subjectivity will be impacted. And then they will have another rational thought. Oh, have we thought about this? So sometimes sharing about emotions, intuition, without them needing to be met rationally is actually influencing our decision process or our creativity or simply our state. Uh, and that's something we've made a heavy use actually in WeFlow, the way we do business goes through what we call an intentional flow. And this intentional flow has an intentional culture that makes more room for rationality, but also what's around it. I appreciate that a lot because when we're working with uncertainty and complexity, it's not data because that's happened. <laughs> it's looking ahead that matters in terms of being able to steer into the future and, and be a part of a future. So there's a couple of tensions that I want to look at. One of them is the tension between what we're talking about, which is using your intuition to foresee organizational intuition, personal and organizational, to let it out, to be able to see what's coming. And the other aspect of that is the way organizations are structured, which is to conform, to be stable and not to rock the boat. And yet we have leaders that have an intuition and it may go completely against all the advice and counsel internally, but they have an intuition that this big jump has got to happen. It's not a logical jump, 
but it is a rational jump because it takes you into new territory. What have you observed there? If we want to, to make use of state of consciousness, if, if we push the threshold far in terms of using the latest evolutions of mindfulness and the collective spaces, collective states, a lot of millennials and Gen Z uh, professionals are, are liking this. Uh, there's a possibility to experience something we call enhanced perception, connecting my intuition and your intuition without it being something that we have to do, but using language as a way to create collective space explicitly that influence collective states and then influence our intuition. We're exploring that tension between using personal intuition and, and plugging it into decision-making when it's the opposite of conforming, when it's the opposite of, of running the organization on a recycling yeah. pattern, when you really want to do breakthrough decision-making, it's going to be a combination. Yeah. More often, it's going to be a leap, an intuitive jump breakthrough versus yeah. just these teeny weeny exactly. incremental steps yeah. that keep everybody yeah. safe, but not really yeah. making the yeah. adaptive yeah. jumps that need to be made. There is a kind of dilemma or paradox or, or balance to find here. We are talking about emergent uh, organization and emergent decisions. What I was mentioning earlier is that this collective perception and hence perception that we can have, it actually allows us to perceive the emergence or what wants to emerge. Therefore, it allows us to feel a collective object, to perceive collective objects, same way we would be meditating on our self or sensation, but we're actually starting to perceive uh, more uh, intuitive collective objects. Uh, the paradox is, okay, how much room am I making for this new structure, this new product to be shaped versus actually making it fit to the structures and the, or the time containers that I rationally have devised or that the regulators uh, need for me to report quarterly uh, for example. Where do we place the cursor in between emergence and rational decision making? And for us, we bring playfulness to that. We've tested many ways of doing things and we kept what worked best. Incrementally, when we bring reflow to organization, the process with which we do that has a lot of emergent features, emergent properties, and emergent actions in it. But then it allows the the directors, the, the organization, and the staff to step-by-step step introduce more emergence in their work. This aspect is extremely engaging. It's very playful, and it's amazing because people feel that their perception, their way of perceiving the business, their way of perceiving their work, and their subjectivity is included in the overall process of creation. It's one of the big factors that increase well-being when we do organizational development with Reflow is the fact that we have an approach that invites that and also uh, complies with the rational requirements and needs. Yeah, so it's a nice combination of those two in, in a naturally human sense. You mentioned that we're human-centered, and, and I've heard people struggle with that. I have a colleague who's doing human-centered labs as a project basis. When we talk about human-centered, we, we might insult the systemic culture of a company that's based on certain things. What does it mean to you? I, I like this question uh, very much. Human-centered, in my simple practical definition, is an approach that includes the subjective experience of the people who are involved in the approach or meant to be impacted by that approach. Uh, in our case, it's uh, human-centered, experiential, experiential change management, experiential development, accelerated. Um, an example is if, I, if I'm giving you a course about human-centered practices and I spend 30 minutes giving you a lecture about what it is. In our world, it's not going to be fully human-centered or compliant with our definition because I haven't stopped and made room for what you as a listener, learner, potential practitioner is experiencing right now. So in our process, we always make room for something for the voice of the person, their experience. We are curious about something that happened in their daily life. We invite them to bring their professional or personal life when we do check-ins. Also, 
we're curious about their state because if I'm trying to teach you something or give you an experience you can reuse, your state will uh, define how much you're able to receive, comprehend, but also integrate and apply. We get curious about people's states and then we give them also the possibility to orient the experience that they are going to be having. If those three criteria are met, bringing part of their life or their interest, inquiring about their state and giving them the possibility to orient their experience, then for us, it becomes an, an experiential way of teaching, doing business, learning, consulting, coaching. It's a real-time, interconnected, <laughs> human-centered. So it honors human connection. I give a small and a larger definition, but I imagine that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you very much. I often wonder whether there's an awareness in companies at the executive level or the management level. This is safety. You're creating safe places to be. Mm -hmm. Whether there's the awareness that those safe places are fractal, people who feel safe, people who are openly able to contribute and are valued in that exchange create very healthy, prosperous companies. That would be the fractal relationship in my mind. Is that what you're seeing? I like that you're bringing the, the topic of fractal safety. I think for the organizations we've helped, it's both helped by the genetic practices that we have and that we use, but also each company generating their own culture. Some of the major innovations made, we had people cry, like new employees joining a company that was supported to create their own culture and process in the onboarding day when they see that in our company, it's okay to experience negative emotional states. They are not something that is frowned upon. We recognize that they have some value and they have some reasons and importance. There is a way to meet them that is given with freedom and kind of a best practice recommended by the company, but also given with freedom, we don't have to apply taking it. And if we want some support for something difficult that's happening between us and a colleague or manager, there's a human support system that is clear, that is on demand, that is not external to the company. And it's also something where the, the people who will help us are highly trained. And the way we choose to relate in the company Nobody will ever tell you what you are experiencing. Nobody will tell you that you should be more serious in the state that you are currently. If somebody is feeling a certain way, they can't tell you that you should feel a certain way. I'm just realizing that I cited a lot of things that myself in my past professional life, I've created a lot of discomfort or sometimes annoyance, or I would say even pain or suffering. So we made those principles clear and they are explicit and people are invited explicitly from my heart to your heart. And they're invited to share what they think about that. They can say yes or no, or maybe, and they are to contribute, to evolve the culture. The culture is simple, five agreements, nothing about values, nothing about rules. It just describes features of how we work together that you can use at any time. And lastly, you mentioned about safety. So something that really our practitioners and our clients really love is that if somebody uh, has something that they imagine or assume about the work, about you, about your experience, uh, they are invited to ask you. And if you see somebody telling you something about your experience that you don't agree, you can say, I see you talking about my experience. Uh, are you open to check this assumption? Right. So basic tools on how to make your own psychological safety. Um, same so, all, but I'm going to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> so this brings me to the idea that Psychological safety has been kicked around a fair bit, and rightly. However, I think what happens is people tend to think that psychological safety is achieved by not taking any risk, by hiding in a cave and protecting oneself from other people or other experiences or other events. For example, big companies right now are in Horizon One 
level of innovation, which means they're not innovating, tweaking, but not the big kind of jumps that we could use in this world today for, toward a real positive beneficial leadership. And the way I see it is that all of the work you're doing, this whole business of reframing psychological safety as being an open and inviting and transparent, very explicitly transparent communications environment is what makes things safe. If you get a hold of that concept, then it, the emotional health and psychological safety and taking big, bold steps in a leadership way are quite fluent flows. They are a natural flow. Would that be a fair way of describing the work? Yes, we have something called the psychological safety stack. And uh, 13 and above and below the layer of psychological safety, one of them is, for example, structural safety, knowing what my role is, who my boss is, what are my goals, what I'm going to ever be evaluated in. If I don't have that, I will feel what we call structurally unsafe. Therefore, I will feel also psychologically unsafe. Or if I'm a founder and I've been giving a lot of work in the first eight months, but we haven't signed the paper that say, what is my share of the startup we are creating? I will feel something relating to financial safety, but it's going to also influence my psychological safety. Because when could I talk about this to whom if a colleague will push back on that? Or when is it going to be safe to talk about it? I'm talking about real life scenarios that we had. It's true that when those layers are properly deliberately met, either because the people have a lot of experience or they've been trained, then it creates a structure that brings more flow. It creates a container where our heart is more open. We feel trusted, we feel nourished. And then a lot of the work will, will flow uh, naturally. One of our clients with a company of uh, about 35 people, after they started implementing meetings in action, which is doing small actions together in online meetings instead of postponing them, they were less tired, they were less uh, overwhelmed, but they also were left with less things to do and less stress in between meetings. Therefore, they felt more safe. One last thing I want to say about safety is quickly in the first few years, we developed a, a practice about tension, dealing with interpersonal tension, and it became part of the DNA of the company. It's uh, part of the living software. And yes, it takes some courage. It takes some to take some risks to go and say, hey, I have a withhold. I would like to talk to you about it. So there's this and also what we call dual channel feedback for human-centered co-founders or conscious companies where we are trying to be very personally developed, but we haven't yet agreed on how we give each other feedback and especially who can take ownership of what responsibility in connection. And so there's some basic philosophical level understanding are in this practice. And when we bring this to startups, it really clarifies a lot and it, it solves a lot of tensions. Right. What would you like to leave our listeners with before we close off this conversation? A, a lot is possible. The vision that you have for your way of growing at work or even in your personal life, all of this is much possible. There's a lot of people working on it and there's practical solutions that already exist. We have a website that is we-flow.net we-flow.net and we have free tasters every two or three weeks. We really like to give experiences to people because we flow is a completely experiential practice. So I invite you to come and try. We also at the integral conference every year or every two years, you might meet us in one of the conferences. Stefan, thank you very much for being on the program and for helping us put these pieces together. It's exciting work. I think it is the work to be done now because it brings these worlds together in such a fluent way that you can't say no. Patrick Lencioni wrote The Five Temptations of CEO, I believe it was in 1998. The Five Temptations are ones that I trace back quite directly to what emotional mastery is all about, emotional transparency and vulnerability so that you can get these emotions to work for you instead of against you. So just to recap, the five temptations of a CEO are to protect the status of their careers over the good of the whole organization. The desire to be popular, well, that prevents a lot of the tougher conversations that need to happen in order for the organization to grow. 
the need to make correct decisions, and that's particularly difficult in climates of uncertainty. The outcome of that is to create a lot of rigid thinking, and that really doesn't help when you need something that's more agile, more adaptable, more fitting for the times. The fourth uh, temptation is the desire for harmony, to be liked over doing the harder stuff. That's one that takes both vision and courage to work through. And the fifth one is the desire for invulnerability, which is, interestingly enough, the exact opposite of what it takes to be a leader. If you want to be a solid leader, vulnerability will get you there. If you want to be fulfilling a role in a routine, very predictable way, then you're going to be trying to hang on to that protection for as long as possible. And I think we're seeing a fair bit of that going on in organizations today because after COVID, the idea of making correct decisions flew out the window. And along with that, the desire to achieve certainty when you're surrounded by uncertainty, volatility, a lot of ambiguity, you're not going to get that predictable results. The final one, harmony. How you achieve harmony is by having the difficult conversation, working with conflict in a, a creative way. It's not to have everyone all happy and delighted 24-7. Uh, Take the tougher issues, work through them, and through that you build trust. My name is Donna Jones. I'm your host. I've been doing these programs now for 16 years as of this year and uh, would love it if you would put a little bit of love inside the tips jar or subscribe over on Patreon or you can also subscribe on a Substack in a paid membership that would help a lot with production. Thanks for joining me. See you on the next program.